Firstly, Cam, thank you so much for uh, the third attempt. <laughs> I'm hoping this one uh, is indeed third time lucky. So I guess back to the first question, uh, a personal favorite. You know, why do you do what you do now? Um, and how did you, how did it happen that you began doing what you did? So kind of what was the backstory? Uh, you growing up, what were the influences and how did it lead uh, to, to what you're doing right now? That's a great question, Roma. But just before I jump into that, I just wanted to say uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues on the Real Leaders Project. It's a fantastic initiative, and you've done a spectacular job so far. Well done. Thank you, Cam. <laughs> okay, so how did I end up where I am today? I, I, part of what has driven my story uh, from the very beginning is insatiable curiosity. Even as a young boy uh, growing up in, in Canada, I was always in trouble with my parents. I was just fascinated with how things worked. So I would take apart the toaster or the radio or the television. And of course, I could never put it back together. So I think my parents were really happy when they saw me channel my curiosity into science, you know, through my education. And I went on to study engineering in university. I was really driven by wanting to understand the physical world. How do things operate? How do they work? How do they fit together? And so uh, while I was fascinated with that uh, intellectually, I think I found that engineering wasn't going to be a profession for me. It just didn't excite me enough. And so when I left university, I went to work in the oil and gas uh, business. And I channeled my curiosity into business, finance, how do companies work? And like many of us in, in our 20s, you know, we're, we're obsessed with getting a career and making money and getting started in life. So those were all the things that drove me. And in the oil and gas industry back in that era, it was a time of major change and consolidation in the industry. So those first 10 years during my 20s in business were full of opportunity, excitement, and challenge. And by the time I entered my 30s, I sort of started to realize that the physical world wasn't as important as I was making it out to be. The people played a much larger role, I'm embarrassed to admit, uh, than I had realized at that age. So no matter how many good ideas we had, no matter how smart we were to figure out the right answers, it didn't matter unless people were willing to get behind it and make it work. It's a big change for me. And so I reassessed where I was channeling my energy and attention really set out at that point in my life and still to this day, my curiosity's channel in terms of what makes us tick as people, what motivates us, why we move in a certain direction versus another, what brings us joy. And so I spent most of my 30s doing that in business, um, but really trying to, again, in the oil and gas industry, which tends to be a scientific industry. It's not very people friendly, it's more about assets and molecules and those types of things trying to get the people equation going. And like many of us uh, in our late 30s, early 40s, I started to ask myself personal questions about, you know, what's my purpose? What am I doing? What, how's my life turning out? All those types of questions. And as I entered my 40s, I sort of had realized that what I'd been doing for the first 20 years of my professional career was doing things that I was good at. I wanted to accomplish things. I wanted to be recognized. And that wasn't always bringing me the joy that I wanted to feel in life. And so I made a promise to myself as I went into my 40s. Called, I called it my Freedom 50 plan. And it wasn't about financial freedom like a lot of the uh, U.S. Uh, insurance commercials promote. But more about freedom from doing work that I didn't like doing, even though I was good at it. And so that took me almost 10 years to accomplish and that really is what started me in a career of consulting and, and getting outside of the corporate world and really changing my attention from changing corporations from the inside to working with more corporations and helping them change from the outside. And, and then, of course, as you know and how we met, Rohan, as I entered my 50s, I started to realize that I devoted a lot of my life to North America and some, sometimes in Europe, but I really didn't understand much about the world the people of the world. And so I had a fantastic opportunity to uh, work in the Middle East. I now live in the Middle East, and it's been a spectacular uh, experience for me. 
again, my curiosity is just fed every day by new things, like like the sandstorm surrounding us here today in Muskegon. Uh, just another fascinating learning for me. So in short, that's it. <laughs> So Cam, you you know in this one you you've answered one of my other favorite, which is uh, you know what are defining moments. But I guess now I I'll move on to a different thing. So how did you how did you come to pick change management and 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 why change management? You know, was there did you know or did you always know or did you um, you know was this a result of some spreadsheet analysis? How did you how did you come to that? Now, that's an interesting question, Rohan, because a lot of people, um, we always want to label things. That's how we understand things and sort them and put them in their place in the world. Yeah. And a lot of people call what I do change management. Yeah. I don't really see it that way. I'm not even sure you can manage change, quite frankly. And so for me, it's it's more, more about improving things. I've, I've just always been driven. So even all the way through as a child, once I started... Uh, figuring out how to put the toaster back together, I was curious about how I can make the toaster better. And so really, it's for, for me, it was about making business better. Even as a, a young uh, manager and, and early executive, it was always about making the organization I was responsible for better. That changed later on to helping people get better. Now, it started out as making them better. Today, I'm wise enough or wiser to realize you can't make people better. They can only choose themselves and yeah. so um, for me it's it's not new it's 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 just something that's evolved it's, it's always been about about helping things get better I have to, my curiosity helps me understand them um, but I yeah it's about change and I, it's not new it's it's always been the same it's evolved in terms of the, the size of the playground that's the only difference so so right now uh, okay if I, if I have to define it easily or if I have to attempt to define it so you know you're working with organizations to make them better right and especially I guess a lot of that happens during periods of change like when we met it was during a huge um, sort of post-merger uh, integration sort of thing now what what assumptions if any do you go in with uh, do you go in with to something like this like you know do you look at organizations broadly as manifestation of people like uh, you know or, or or is it much more complex than that how do you go about dealing with a monster that is say changing a you know a, you're looking at a culture change of 10,000 people uh, what assumptions yeah how, how do you even approach something like that that's another uh, provocative question Rohan um, the word assumption sort of it's a hot button but I, I try real hard not to go into any situation with assumptions. Hmm. It's, it, it's the number one tripping point for me. Now, that's hard when you've been doing something for a long time and you've seen it many times. Yeah. It starts looking and sounding exactly the, the same, same as the last one. Yeah. And it's so many consultants I work with, I see them do that. They instantly jump to conclusions and jump to solutions. Many executives do this. Yeah. And so um, while it often has... A, a positive effect in terms of getting something happening quickly, my experience is it doesn't, as it doesn't result in a meaningful and, and sustainable change. And so I actually try as best as I can to go in with a clean slate. Um, if I change the word assumptions to beliefs, yeah. are, do I go in with some beliefs? Yeah. yeah, I do believe that all businesses are about people at the end of the day. Without question, depending on the industry you're in, you need all sorts of other things. You need all sorts of brilliant ideas, scientific breakthroughs, and marketing plans, and all those things. At the end of the day, there isn't a business or an organization on the planet that I know of hmm. that is successful without people doing something. Hmm. You know, the real, the real uh, leaders project wouldn't be anything without you and your colleagues behind it. It wouldn't be anything without people like me helping you by participating. Yeah. So I, I do believe that very deeply. I also believe that no matter how many times I've been told in my life that we're all different and that we need to respect our differences, yeah. there is a big, big part of me that believes that we're more the same than we, we, uh, we sometimes are willing to accept. That doesn't mean we shouldn't respect the differences. It's just sometimes we get obsessed with them. And for me, 80% of us were, were essentially the same. We had the same motives, the same drives, the same needs. Whether regardless of our religion, our ethnicity, our our profession, and so that's that's been a, a, a good guide for me, uh, certainly in the last ten years or so, as I've 
mentioned in many different types of organizations to see if I can help. So the the next one, which I'm which I'm particularly interested in as well, is you uh, as an as your you know one of one of the big parts of what you do is being an executive coach, um, and you've obviously worked with many uh, a real leader. Um, I'd love I'd love to understand your point of view on on what what is is there anything that you've seen in common um, amongst these folk uh, in, in their careers? Uh, you know, has there been a consistent theme in in in, the, in a personality or in character? You know, what is what has your observation been from from you know having coached and worked with so many executives? Um, well, let me share with you a couple of things that other people helped me see. Yeah. Um, I wish I could say that I, I figured them out or observed them for myself. They were things that are people help me see. Um, one of them was from a, a, a university professor that was also a part-time consultant that we were working on a project together. It was a leadership program for a, a, a large corporation. And the, the senior executives decided that they wanted to bring the 19 most talented up-and-coming risers in the company uh, in for a week to work with them and have an educational experience and be recognized for, for who they are, these shining stars. And, you know, on one late night, as we were going through all these details, he shared two things with me that have stuck with me ever since. One was, he said, and, you know, we're about to invite the most insecure people in the company into this session, even though they're incredibly accomplished. <laughs> And at first, my brain wanted to reject that notion, but before I could even open my mouth, I was convinced it was true. And so one of the things that I do believe drives many people to so-called success and greatness that we label so uh, strongly in the Western world, at least, about rising to the top of organizations is an incredible insecurity. They're just driven um, to, to succeed by someone else's standard and, and to get an A or an A+. Plus. And so I do find that's a quality of many leaders in business that I work with. Mm. Those that are most successful have learned to tame that and to become humble in the process and become more secure. For many people, it, takes, it just takes time. You know, most of us are slow learners like me. It, it takes us 20 or 30 years. And every once in a while, like the leader we work with together in the project, you're running somebody that's remarkably uh, talented and wise at a very young age. But it's it, uh, I, that's that's one. The, the other is is that I think that um, those that I've seen overcome adversity is they just refuse to accept that things can't happen, no matter how many facts, how many people tell them that it's impossible. They're just determined to find a solution. So those are two simple ones, but but at least for me, powerful ones. Yeah. Okay. Now you know we co- we come into another one, uh, which is insecurity and self confidence, right? So so um, so it, it, it's an interesting topic because it, it, at least at least from my observations, it it always felt like you know uh, uh, some of the some of the highest elite organizations in the world and the highest elite universities in the world literally are often a breeding ground of just extremely insecure people who are out there to prove a point. Uh, what, I, what I wonder sometimes is, I, I actually, I have two questions, and, 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 and they're musings more than anything else. One of them is, if insecurity leads you to success, does it necessarily lead you to happiness? And, and I, it, it, I, I wonder, because you know, you're, you're used to having somebody else's measure um, for something. So I just wonder if it translates across to life. Um, and, and the second is, um, where do the confident or the self-confident people go? And Okay, so a couple of things there. There's three or four questions in there. Um, the first one is, is, at least what I heard from you as a conclusion, um, that insecurity leads to success. I, I'm not convinced of that at all. No. You asked me about qualities of people that were successful, and I said I find a lot of them are insecure. To me, there's just as many, a lot more insecure people that never see. Yeah, no, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other one, the other one is, is does does this lead to happiness? You know what? I don't know the answer to that question, Roland. Um, I, I really believe uh, deep down in my soul that happiness is something we're all trying to figure out for our entire time here, <laughs> and and I'm not sure that anybody ever really has the answer. Yeah. 
Um, I know I don't. Yeah. So I'm not the one to, to give you an answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, okay. The, the, the next one is another topic that, that I've uh, discussed with you once, right? With all these leaders you deal with, uh, do you think they were born leaders or did they become leaders? Uh, what, you know, how much of it is nature? How much of it is nurture? Uh, what is your sense? And, and the other implication of this question is, I'm sure in, in many of places you go, they talk about leadership development um, as a concept. You know, do you believe in this concept? Okay, so uh, again, two big questions. Lots, lots been written on this, lots debated about it, many schools of thought. Um, I'll, I'll share with you my beliefs around yeah. it. Um, you know, as much as I hate to uh, accept it, I actually do believe there's something innate about people that seem to succeed in leading others. Okay. I, I'm just the type of person that always wanted, always wanted, and still tend to want to believe in everybody. Um, a lot of scientific investigation over my life has has told me the opposite: um, that not everyone is equal, not everyone can make it. Um, give, give everyone a paintbrush, they won't be Picasso. Um, and so, I do believe there's innate qualities uh, about people. That I don't think there's a formula for it. I think many different people find a path to success in their own unique way. Um, and, and some leaders are bigger than life and are about inspiring people, and others, not so much. They're just brilliant behind the scenes like the Wizard of Oz. They're, they're, they're pulling the levers. And so I just think there's many different formulas for success there. But I do think it's something about them. And at least in my work, that's one of my first uh, obligations to them is to try to figure out what that is about them so that we can make that its fullest and brightest in the moment. It's often not about overcoming weaknesses. We spend so much time, especially in Western culture, trying to fix what's broken with us. And at least this stage in my life, I, I think we have to manage those things. We have to make sure we're mitigating uh, risk or, or severe damage. But it's more important to know who we really are and what our true strengths are and let those flourish. So that's part one. Part two of your question, I believe, was about leadership development. Yeah. I absolutely do believe that we can all develop as leaders. I think we can all become more effective. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that most of the stuff out there is all that helpful. Um, it's, it's highly programmatic. It's mechanistic. It's, it's, it's obsessed with uh, the concept that knowledge acquisition is the key to all success. Yeah. And that's just not consistent with my experience of life. It's not that knowledge isn't important. It's just a very, very small part of the equation. And so for me, one of the most powerful ways of helping people develop as leaders is to put them in leadership situations and just let them let them figure it out, let them survive. If, if you can offer them some wise coaching, some, some helpful coaching, not instructional coaching, then I think it's all the more powerful. To me, those have been the most uh, significant forms of leadership development I've seen. So how not that there isn't a place for training, it's not that there isn't a place for program, just left to their own. Uh, my experience in the science that I've read for the past 20 years suggests that the payback on that is it is minimal. So so you know, you, to, coaching leads me to this question, right? So one thing that I find is, you know, until we are 17, for example, uh, or 18, we, we're we're at home, we have Sort of a board of director in, in our in our in our parents, right? And and they're kind of guiding us uh, and helping us along the way and being our coach when necessary. Uh, and and then all of a sudden you jump into university and then you're in a, you're in a completely free world. You're in free electron, and that carries on till you find a boss. And you know if you find a good boss, it's different from not having a good boss, etc. What I've personally found is having sort of coach-like figures or wiser friends, as you like to call them, has been immensely helpful just because it's nice to have somebody challenging your beliefs and, you know, giving you a sense of what, what life is on the other side. Uh, is this something that you've observed in, 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 your, in executives you've trained? Are the ones who seek out coaching proactively or had coaches, you know, in better places? Or, or do you just feel like, this is a person-to-person, -person, very personal thing, um, and and you know some people need it and some people don't. What, like I, I'm I'm not sure how coaching fits into this whole thing and if people ought to seek out coaches. 
I think my answer to all your questions is yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's just it, it's just not a simple not a simple formula or a simple answer in my experience. I do find that the people that seem to to be the most effective um, are have the ability to to listen uh, or to be guided by others in some way. Some people's egos are just too big. Yeah. Um, even those people I find are incredibly focused at understanding what others do hmm. uh, and, and how, how someone else. So, you know, a more scientific approach might be I'm going to study other people's research. I'm going to find the best practices, whatever that is, and then I'm going to adopt it. For some people, it's, it's finding wise counsel. Uh, for me, um, I, and I think many others, uh, Rohan, I'm not sure we grow up with the board of directors in our, our childhood, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, while that brings some adversity, I know for me that that has put me in search of others, uh, providing with guidance from a very young age. And so I feel incredibly fortunate for all the incredible people I've met in my life who I, I've learned something from. Um, in some ways, I think that that was was opportunity, but I think in some ways you also have to see it as opportunity. Yeah. And check our ego. Um, and, and, and just close our mouths, open our ears, and listen. And and as I get older, I think it's more about listening than it is about anything else. You know, I, I heard this nice quote from, uh, from somebody who says, uh, advice is like aspirin. Um, you have to take it for it to work. Uh, just talking to it will not uh, will not make your headache go away. Uh, and he's made, made, made me smile. Uh, your final couple of questions, Cam. One of them is actually a very practical question. This is something I, I, I like asking because often, you know, our, our uh, discussions are like these full of ideas. Uh, so are there any uh, productivity, uh, little things you do or little practical things that help you uh, stay productive, be organized, or I don't know, live a better life? You know, are there any... You know, simple things that you would like to share that, that others can put, potentially implement or an idea or, or, or. Yeah. Again, all I can do is sort of share with you my own experience. Yeah. Uh, and that hasn't always been uh, successful. <laughs> I, I think my, my approach to those things has changed a lot over my life. Some of it's about wisdom. Some of it's about circumstance. You know, as a young person, raising a young family, working as a junior person in the corporation, a lot of your life is managed for you. Yeah. And so it, it's more about survival tactics than anything else. It's about it's about just getting through it all and keeping it all in check. And so those more basic type of organizational skills and just, you know, uh, pausing to listen and, and, and act uh, accordingly, I think, you know, were, were a big part of my early life. I, I think at this stage in my life, one of the things I love about, about today's world is the abundance of information. You know, Google is my best inanimate friend. Like, it's just, it's just amazing to me. You know, when I was, when I was in school, I mean, you had to go and, you know, and get, and get a book somewhere out of a library and, and check it out and hope it was there. And so, at the same time, that information can be overwhelming. It can be distracting. And, and so many young people, uh, talented, intelligent people that I meet, like yourself, um, are so obsessed with just getting more and more and more information that I wonder uh, two things. How can your brain handle it all without exploding? And then two, which is just part of my personality and psychological makeup, is what are you going to do with it all? Yeah. And so for me, it's really about simplifying and, and just simplifying my life, simplifying decision-making, and that usually comes down to some fundamental about having principles, so that no matter what I get bombarded with in any given moment, I know what my principles are, so I won't be confounded by the situation or the amount of variables. The other is just start slowly, you know, developing a number of mental models, so they're kind of beliefs with a bit of structure around them. Um, and so that no matter whose new quote I hear of the day or some new fantastic eight-step process that somebody's come up with, rather than try to contain all those in my memory somewhere, which just isn't that good anymore, it's more about integrating those in my own sort yeah. of set of, of mental models and belief systems so that I keep it simple, even though it's incredibly complex behind the scenes. It's kind of like an iPhone. 
simple to use on the on the touch screen, probably very hard to understand and build on the inside. Makes sense. Final question. Uh, is there an I- idea that inspires you that you would like, an idea or ideas that inspires you that you would like to share? Can you tell me a bit more about that question, Rohan? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so the, I guess the why behind the question is some of us have, you know, some idea of or driving belief that inspires us. So I had an interview on Saturday where his driving belief or, or his, his big idea was that, you know, you are what you do. Um, and somebody else had something completely different, right? So, so I'm always very interested to see what, what comes on top of mind when, when, when I ask that question. Mm. Yeah, there's probably, probably many. Uh, I think the one that I, I run into most often and have to remind myself of most often is don't assume. <laughs> Don't jump to conclusions. Don't don't too quick to judge. Don't just just pause. Just pause. Um, always give the other person the benefit of the doubt. It's about a human interaction. Um, no need to usually rush as much as most of us try. That, that one I run into every day. I have to remind myself of a hundred times a day. So I don't know whether that gets uh, gets home with your question, but it does. That's all I have to offer. It does. It does. Okay, thank you so much.